Good afternoon and welcome to today's accounting telematics broadcast. Great living learners, exciting times is lying ahead. You'll be the first learners that will be writing two accounting papers at the end of this year. So there will be paper one, which is 200 marks, sorry, which is 150 marks for two hours. And there will be paper two, 150 marks for two hours as well. So you'll be the first people writing two papers. Right, so that is very exciting. So hopefully at the end of the session, we will have time to show you what will the content be for paper one and the content be for paper two. But for today, we're looking at activity number six. That's in your book. And in the workbook, you'll find that on page number 12 to 14. We're specifically looking at cash budgets. And this will be paper two content. Okay, I'm going to repeat the cash budgets, and that will be paper two content. So if you can go to those pages in the activity book and in the workbook, and then hopefully we should be able to follow today's lesson. Right? So let's go to those pages, and then we have a look at it. Okay. So the first thing they're asking us to do is they want us to complete a debtor's collection schedule. Okay. So what do we have that's in the workbook? We already have some of those figures that's typed in there already. So we have the credit sales for September, for October, November. We don't have the credit sales for December, and we don't have the credit sales for January. Then also we have collections already. We have figures for November, and we have figures for October, and then we have a figure there in the January column. So what we're looking at, the first thing that we have to do, we have to look at, because it's a debtor's collection schedule, the debtors are connected to the credit sales. So we have to calculate the credit sales for December and for January 1st, and then we'll go through the collection policy. So if we look at the information that they're giving us, they're telling us that cash sales is 60% of the total sales. And the actual and the budgeted total sales, total sales for December is 297,500. But if 60% is cash, then the remaining portion, the 40%, then that will be credit. So if we're looking to calculate the credit sales, the credit sales portion will be the 40%, because together the total sales will be equivalent to 100%. So if 60% is cash, then the remaining 40% will be credit. So if we're looking to calculate the credit sales for December, we have to go to the total sales for December, and then you have to multiply with 40% so that you can get the 119,000. Okay, let me just run us through that again. The total sales for December is 297,500. And the total sales for January is 332,500. 60% is cash, therefore 40% is credit. So I need a calculation. So just have to go 297,500, multiply the 40%, and it gives me 119,000. And in the same way, I take the total sales for January, which is 332,500. I multiply that by 40%, so I can get the credit sales. So now I have the credit sales for all the months that they are giving me. So also in the information, they must give me the collection policy or the trend the way that the debtors normally settle their accounts. Okay, so what it's saying, it says, debtors are expected to settle their accounts as follows. So these are the debtors because these figures over here from the 99,000 until the 133,000, those are all the credit sales and those are all the amounts that the debtors owe me. So these are the credit sales. So I'm just looking at, I sold to the debtor in September for 99,000. Then it says, 
55% of those debtors paid in the month. In other words, 55% of them paid in September. I don't have a column for December. That's why we didn't do that calculation. 35% 35 paid in the month after September. In the month after September was October. So we didn't have to calculate that. Right? So, so that's all you do. So now it's just 35% in the month, and then you just go on from there. So all we have to do, we just have to get the collection policy to Rick. That's all we have to do. And as you can see, it's going to add up to 100. So I've got 55, 35, that gives me 90, and then 10% of them will go bad. Okay? So all we have to do is, if I'm in October, 55% in the month following the sale. So in other words, 55% of them are going to pay in November, but I have to take away a 4% discount. And then it says 35% will pay in the month after that. So in other words, if I go to October, that's now the 90,000. 35% of them will pay in the month after, right? which was the 31,500. And that's where that figure is coming from. So it's 35% in the second month. I mean, October. So they're paying me in November and in December because it says in the month after and then in the second month after. So I'm in October. 55 minus 4% I'm getting in November and then I'm getting 35% in December. We don't collect the 10% because the 10% is seen as bad debts and bad debts is classified as a non-cash item. We won't be getting that 10% from the debtor. That's the amount of money that we'll be losing that we'll have to create an expense called bad debts. Okay? Right, so if I'm in the month of November, I don't collect money in the same month because the collection policy says in the month following. That's 30 days later. So I'll be getting some of that money, 55% of that money, I'll be getting in the month after November, which means I'll be getting some of that money in December. So what will that calculation be? I'll have to take the November sales, multiply it by the 55%, because that's the collection. But because they're paying in the month after, we're giving them a 4% discount, because normally debtors are supposed to settle their accounts in 30 days. So that calculation will be 105,000 multiplied by 55%, multiply by 96% because we're giving them a 4% discount. If we were giving them a 5% discount, then we just had to multiply it by 95%. And that answer will come to 55,440. Okay, so that will be that particular calculation. Please have a look at the placement. It's in November but I'm collecting the money in the month after November, which will be December. So that 55% will go in the December column, but I will have to take away a 4%. Then I'm still in the November column, and then I should get some money in January. So if I go through the collection policy again, I'm in the November column. 55% minus 4% we will, we will receive in December. And in 35%, I will get in two months. So if I'm in November, I'm getting money in December and in January. So the January calculation will be, look at the November total, it's 105, and just multiply it by 35%. And then you place that there. Then again, we've exhausted the collection policy so we don't calculate the 10% because the 10% is also bad and it will never appear in the data's collection schedule. Okay, and there you can see if I'm in December, you can't get any money in November because you are in December. And according to the collection policy, 
you also don't collect money in the same month, you only start collecting in the month after. Then all we have to do now, grade 11, so we have to total the December column and we have to total the January column. Once again, those figures were just the 40% and then we just start collecting through the collection policy. Okay. So those were the, will be the totals for those two columns over there. Okay, let's just pause a bit so we can just digest that. Just remember, the collection policy says in the month after. So you always get the money, like November, for example. You don't get in the same month, you get in the month after. And then again in the month after that. And the same with December. You don't get the money in December. You only get the money in the month after, which will be January. But then there will be a 4% cash discount, and that's why we have to multiply with the 96%. Okay, so these figures here, the November and the December and the January totals, those figures will be forwarded to the cash budget. That will be in the line collection from debtors. So those three figures will, will be forwarded to the cash budget, and it will form in the line collection from debtors. Okay, let's just move on. Then the next thing that they have is a creditor's payment schedule. Okay. All those figures are in your answer book and it's in the question paper as well. The only thing is we have to they're giving me the sales and we have to calculate the cost of sales. So there should be information. So it says the business is currently using a markup of 25%. And then it says they plan to reduce this to 75%. So if they want to reduce it to 75%, in order for me to get the cost of sales, I'll have to multiply with 100 divided by 175. But for the October month, right, you have to, that was done on the times 100 divided by 225. So that was done already. Okay, so using this information, we have to calculate the cost of sales for November and we have to calculate the cost of sales for December. So that will just be 262,500. That's my sales for November. Multiply by 100 divided by 175. Then I get my cost of sales for November. Then in the same way, I'll take my December sales, 297,500, and I multiply that by 100 divided by 175. And I'll get 170. Okay, and in the same way, that calculation was done. 332,500 times 100 divided by 175 to give me the 190. Right, now, what's very important, grade 11, that the line is sales, cost of sales. That line is not gross profit. That line says payments. In other words, payment to creditors. So when we're in the budget, when you are calculating the cost of sales, you are actually calculating the purchases. Okay, so what it says, purchases of trading stock. Trading stock is replaced in the month in which they are sold. Therefore, it says that the cost of sales is equal to your purchases. So once you have calculated the cost of sales, Using that particular formula, 100, depending what the markup is, it's always 100 on top. At the bottom, it will always be 100 plus whatever the markup is. So in October, it was 100 over 225 because the markup was 125%. But in November and December, the markup was 75%, so it will just be 100 over 175. That will, be, that will give you the cost of sales figure. And once you have the cost of sales, you actually have the purchases. Then it says, all the purchases are on credit. In other words, there's no cash purchases. So everything is on credit. Then it says that we payment is made in the month following the purchase. In other words, if I buy on credit, 
in October, I will pay them in November. If I buy on credit in November, I will pay them in December. If I buy on credit in December, I will pay them in January. So that line is not gross profit because we see sales, cost of sales, and we think that the next line is gross profit. It will be the payment to the creditors. Okay, that's payment to creditors. So that 104,000, and as you can see, 255 minus 100 does not give you 104,000. That is a payment that you made to a creditor for the items that you bought on credit in September. Because according to the payment policy, it says payment is made in the month following. So if you're buying on credit in September, then we're paying them in October. If we're buying on credit in October, we're paying them in November. If we're buying in November, we're paying them in December. And if we're buying in December, we're paying them in January, but subject to a 5% cash discount. So if we want to calculate what amount we're going to pay in November, we have to go to October's purchases, which is 100,000. And I have to multiply it with 95% because we're getting a 5% discount. Then this figure over here, that will be 95%. Then who do I pay in December? I have to go to November's payment, November, that cost of sales. So I have to pay them in December, because I'm paying them in the month following, but subject to a 5% discount. So that calculation will be December's payment, which is this amount over here. I need 150,000, which is that purchases, and multiply that by 95%. Then we want to do the January. I need to go to December's purchases which is December's cost of sales, and multiply that by 95% to get that figure. Okay, just have a look again, please. Make sure that you are aware that that is payment to creditors and that line is not the gross profit. Because we tend to say sales minus cost of sales gives you the gross profit, but that is the payment. And according to the payment policy, it says that we're paying in the month following. So who gets paid in November? The people from October, but minus 5%. Who gets paid in December? The people from November, but minus 5%. And who gets paid in January? The creditor from December, but minus 5%. Okay, let's have a look. Just make sure you understand why we're doing that. Because in order for us to calculate the cost of sales, we need the sales, so it's the sales, will give me cost of sales, and cost of sales will equal purchases. And there's no split between the purchases because it says all the purchases are on credit. So that cost of sales is actually your purchases, and then we just have to pay them in the month after, but minus 5%. Okay, let's just move on. But then also in your answer book, they're giving us the cash receipts part of the budget. So what we did now for presentation purposes, we just separated them. So we're first going through all the receipts, and then we're doing all the payments, and some of those figures are already typed in for you. Okay? So that line, receipts from debtors, that line is actually coming from your debtors collection. Okay? So let's just have a look what's happening over here. That line is coming from your debtors collection. That was the the previous, to, um, that was the second slide that we showed. Okay. Then the next item, because earlier they said cash sales is 60%. So I need to calculate what is the cash sales for December and what is the cash sales for January. So remember, they, they gave me the, the sales, 297,500, and it says 60% is cash, so I just had to multiply that, and I have to place it in the budget for that particular month. And the 40% went to the data's collection, and then when we completed the data's collection, 
we got to those figures over there. And in the same way, I need to do January. So the January sales was 332,500. I multiply that by 60% because the information said 60% was cash. So that's the 60%. And then we just have to place that figure in over there. Okay, then they've got an item. It says there's a fixed deposit with a balance of 120,000. And it says one of the fixed deposit will mature in December. So nothing is happening in November and nothing is happening in January. Everything will be happening in December. But it says that the fixed deposit was originally invested in, on the 1st of January. And the interest is 10% and it's compounded annually, which means it's compound interest. And I invested in the on the 1st of January, and I'm now on the 31st of December, which means I have the investment for two months, and the in so, sorry for two years, and the interest will also be included. So in your answer book, there's a calculation for compound interest, which is take your investment, that's your P, which will be the 40,000 and multiply it by 1 plus R, that R will be the 10% to the power N. Now, N will then be the number of years that you have the item, and it says it's compounded annually, which means you have it two years, so N's value will be 2. Let me just go through that again. P will be your investment, the 40,000. Multiply it by the percentage because we're adding, we're calculating the interest together with the fixed deposit, and the N will be the number of years that you have it, and it says it's compounded annually, and because you have it two years, the value of N will be two. And there's your formula, so it's going to be 40,000 multiplied by one plus R, that's your 10 percent, to the power two because of compounded annually. So you'll be getting. 48,400, but 40,000 was the fixed deposit, and 8,400 will be the interest on fixed deposit. But on this particular day, you'll be getting the, that whole amount. So it will be the fixed deposit that is maturing, which means it's expiring, you're getting the money back, and the interest is included in the payment. So that is how much you'll be receiving, which is 48,400. And because that's the only column that we have to add, that will be that total. Okay, just have a look at that slide. Just make sure you understand when we substituting in the formula why, it, why the value of N is 2, because you have the fixed deposit for two years, from the 1st of January until the 31st of December 2019, and that was invested on the 1st of January 2018. So you add it for the whole of 2018, and you add it for the whole of 2019. And that is why it's the value of N is 2, because it was compounded annually. The interest was added at the end of the year, and then it's added again. Okay, let me just sit for that slide. Okay. Okay. In the second part of the cash budget, as you know, the first part was the receipts. Just can go back. So you can see it was that was the receipts. The second part of the budget is the payments, which means these will be the payments that we have to make in the November, in the December, and in the January columns. And also, they have a figure that's typed in already, and that figure is. 237,350. I think there was a typing error. So that figure will just be 237,350 and not the figure as it is in the workbook. So can we just change that quickly? It will be 237,350. Okay, so please have a look at the items that they're giving. They're gi giving us payment to creditors. 
So that was the payment that we made where we converted the sales into the cost of sales and then we paid. Okay. Then we're paying on the mortgage bond. We have salaries and wages. The owner will be taking cash drawings. The owner will be buying a vehicle. He's paying insurance. He's paying advertising and he has other operating expenses. So some of those figures were tapped in already. Just remember that figures would be 237,350. So let's see what the information is given. Right. Those figures are coming from the earlier slide when we had that payments, when we were converting the sales to the cost of sales, which is the purchases, and then we minus a 5% discount. Okay, so now they've got some information regarding a mortgage bond. It says the mortgage bond, which means the item affected will be the payment on the mortgage bond. The monthly repayments on the mortgage bond is 15,000. Here you can see we already paid for November 15,000. And it says it's going to remain 15,000 until the end of the budget period, which means 15,000 in November and 15,000 in December and then 15,000 again in January. November's 15,000 was typed in, so we only have to write in the 15,000 for December and the 15,000 for January. That was simple and straightforward. Just remember it says it remain until the end, so it's 15,000 each month after that. Okay, then they've got information regarding salaries and wages. It says there are four shop assistants and they earn 4,000 rand per month each. So in total, it's four multiplied by 4,000. Then it says, one of the shop assistants has resigned with effect from December. So when you're looking at December, I won't be having four shop assistants. I'll only be having three shop assistants. Then it says that the person that has resigned will not be replaced. The remaining assistants, in other words, the other three, they will all receive an increase of 20% each. So I'll be having three shop assistants for December, and I'll have to multiply it by 4,800. So where does the 4,800 come from if it says that they're only earning 4,000 rand per month? But just remember here, it says that the remaining assistants will receive an increase of 20%. So it's 20% of 4,000. Gives you 800 rand. So going into December, the shop assistants will no longer be earning 4,000 rand. They will be earning 4,800. And there's no longer four of them. There's only three of them. So we have to multiply three Multiply by 4,800 gives me 14,400 for the shop assistants. Then it says there's one bookkeeper and one manager, and they earn 6,200 per month each. So there's two of them, and they're earning 6,200 each. So I have to multiply, and it gives me 12,400. Then it also says that they will receive an increase of 400 rand per month each as from January. But we want to calculate December. So they won't be getting an increase in December. They will only be getting an increase in January. So when we have to do the calculation for January, then the bookkeepers and the manager, those figures will change. And then the, Janu the January figures for the shop assistants will remain again. Okay, so all I have to do to be the three times the 4,800, because they got a 20% increase. Which gives me 4,800, 14,400. And two at 6,200 gives me 12,400. I add that, and I get that figure of 26,800. Okay, then I need December. Right, there it is, 26,800. So now I need to go to January. So the shop assistants, their salaries will remain at 
14,400. So it still just be three of them because it says they will not be replaced. So it's three times 4,800. But now they'll be getting an increase of 400 rand. So instead of earning 6,200, they'll be earning 6,600. And I need to multiply that by two. Gives me the 13,200. And then I add. And that figure will go over there. It's all about reading. It says the shop assistants will get the increase in December, but the bookkeeper and the manager will get the increase in January. Okay, One of them is resigning, so I have three left. And the three will receive a 20% increase on the 4,000 rand per month. So it will just be 20%, and that's where it comes to the 4,800. Okay, let's move to the next item. The next item, they're talking about insurance. So it says the monthly insurance premium is currently 3,300, which is the figure that's typed in already in the November column. Then it says the premium will be reduced by 10% as from January, which means we will no longer be paying 3,300, we'll be paying 10% less due to the fact that there was no claims lodged in the last three years. Okay. So now, the insurance for December will remain 3,300, because the reduction only kicks in January. So 3,300 for December, and then 90%. Why? Because we get, we're paying 10% less, so we'll only be paying 90% of the current amount. Or well, what you can do, you can just minus 3,300, which is the 10%, and then you should get 2,970. So those are the figures for December and for January. Okay, so let's look at the drawings. What's the owner doing? It says the owner is taking drawings of 10,000 rand per month. 7,000 rand is cash, and the rest is in trading stock. So the drawings of the trading stock, that is seen as a non-cash item. The 3,000 rand is only the value of the trading stock. We want to know how much cash the owner is taking, and he's taking 7,000 rand cash. But in total, it is 10,000 rand in drawings. But how much cash drawings is he taking? Only 7,000. So those figures will just be 7,000 each and every month. Okay, see, let's see what happens to the business vehicle. It says the business plans to purchase a delivery vehicle on the 15th of November. The cost is 300,000. That doesn't mean he's paying 300,000 in November. It says... 20% deposit will be paid on this date, which means in November he's paying a deposit of 20%. So 20% of 300,000 will give me 60,000. So the 20% of the deposit, that will give me the 60,000. Right, so the 60,000 will go. Then for December it says the balance will be paid in equal installments over 24 months. So what's the balance? 240 divided by 24 gives you 10,000. So the deposit will go in November. And then in December will be a 10,000, and in January will be a 10,000. So that will be that figures. Okay, then it's talking about advertising. Advertising is paid monthly at, and budgeted at 2% of the monthly sales. So I need to look at my sales figures. Not my cash or my credit sales, but my total sales and then I just have to multiply them by 2%. So it will be 2% of the November sales, 2% of the December sales, and also 2% of the 
January sales. And that will be the figures for the advertising. Then it just says the other operating expenses. It says the total spent during October was 25,000. And then it is expected to increase by 800 rand per month. So it will be 25,200 in October. When we get to November, it will be 800 more, which will give me 26,000. When I get to December, it will be 800 more than November. And when we get to January, it will be 800 more than December. So for November, it will be 25,000 that was spent, 25,200 that was spent in October, plus 800, it gives me 26,000. 26,000 was spent in November, plus 800. 26,800 was spent in December plus 800 and gives me 27,600. And those will be the figures for these months. So November, 800 more than October. December, 800 more than November. And January, 800 more than December. Okay. So now we've populated all the payments. So now we just have to get the total payments to see what is the total payments. Here we go. Just remember that that one figure was typed in already, and it was corrected at 237,350. Now we just have to add. Okay. But for now, we have the total receipts, and we have the total payments, and then this is the bottom part of the cash budget. And then we also have the opening balance of the bank, that's typed in already. It stands at 6,780. Then they've got a line, cash surplus or deficit. The surplus or deficit is nothing more than the total receipts minus the total payments. Even if the total payments is more than the receipts, we're still going to say total receipts minus total payments. So in November's case, we're going to say 239,670 minus 239,950. Can we see that the November payments is more than the November receipts? So now we'll have a deficit in that column over there. And that will be shown in brackets, or we can have a minus in front. Okay. And then in the same way, we're going to do the December and the January, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, here we go. So it's 313,840 minus 237,350, and we we'll get 76,490. 29982 minus 258,320 gives me 40,762. So those are all, that is the deficit. Why? Because the payment was more than the receipts, but those two figures are surplus because my receipts is more than the payments. Okay. So now we're following a principle where it says the closing balance of November will be the opening balance for December. And then the closing balance for December will be the opening balance for January. It's as if we're balancing. The business will continue with the operations in the future. So now we are balancing. That's why we're changing the date. So now that will be 6,500, and it is a positive number. So it's that plus that gives me 6,500. Then the 6,500 is the closing balance for November, which is the same as the opening balance for December. Both of them are positive, so now we have to add. That will be my closing balance for December, which will be my opening balance for January. 
And then I'm going to just calculate the closing balance. It's again two positives. So we just have to add. And that will be the final balance over there. So that will be my closing balance for January, which is the 123. Let's just see. Here you can see that we offset the negative from the positive. So we got 6,500. The closing balance for November is the opening balance for December. Both of them are positive. So we're adding. Then the closing balance for December will be the opening balance for January. And then we just have to calculate the closing balance for January. Again, both of them are positive, so we just have to add. Okay, That will be the end of the budget, grade 11. So let's just look at the last question that they're asking us over there. Do you think it was wise to reduce the markup from 125% to 75%? Then you need to quote figures or calculations to support your answer. So if you can remember, the question goes over November, December, and January. And when we're getting to November and December, business normally need to stimulate their sales. So they're looking to bring down the selling price and have sales because they know the consumers have money. They have, they have received their bonuses at the end of the year. It is festive season. So now they're looking to stimulate their sales. So we would say then the answer would be, yes, it was a wise, only based on the facts that we're going to see after this now. Okay? Why? Because the budgeted sales should increase from 225,000 to 262,000. It's a monthly increase of 35, more or less 35,000 rand per month. So why, is it in, why are we increasing in December? Because we know the people are having received their bonuses, so they want to spend. That is why we have to more or less have sales. But obviously the cost of sales figure was also going to increase. But the gross profit will decrease in November, but then it will again increase by 15,000 in December and in January. And then obviously a decrease in the markup can result in reduced selling prices, which can stimulate sales over the holiday season in December and January. That is why the, there's an increase in the sales figure for December and in January. Okay, let's just give you some time just to write those down quickly. Okay, then grade 11, the next two slides will be the content for paper one and for paper two. When we started, I said we'll be showing you the content for paper one and for paper two. So the next two slides will be for paper one and for paper two. But please be aware that some content might either be in paper one or paper two. But when we look at the slides now, then I will tell you which items might appear in both papers because it will be easy like that. Okay, let's just have a look at that. So there we have, that's your paper one content. It will be 150 marks for two hours. So what will be in that paper? You're looking at core principles, ledger accounts of partnerships, like the capital account, the current account, the drawings account of the two partners, also the interest on capital, the bonus to partners, the salaries to partners, and also the appropriation account. And remember, you need to apportion the remaining profit. Right? Then also, what we did was there was ledger accounts of clubs, but that item will not be examined. Okay, The club accounting will not be examined. Okay. But the ledger accounts of the partnerships, that will be examined. Then we also have the accounting equation. Okay, because the special accounts only pertaining to partnerships, those are the accounting equation items that we could ask. Okay. Then there will obviously be adjustments and final accounts, like the appropriation account, the trading account, and the profit and loss. 
So the adjustments and the statement of comprehensive income and the statement of the financial position, formerly called the income statement and the balance sheet, that will be one of the topics. Generally, that will be one of the main questions. Okay. Then we're also going to have analysis and interpretation of financial statements. We need to know the ratios. There will be current ratio, there will be asset test ratio, the partner's earnings. So please be aware, you will also be receiving a formula sheet, but the name of the particular ratio won't be given. But the ratio itself will be given, but we won't be telling you current ratio is current assets is to current liabilities. We'll just be giving you current assets is to current liabilities. In the last three items, the valuation of fixed assets, all about the additions, depreciation, and asset disposal, they could be tested in either paper. That's why we have the hashtag over there. So the, the valuation of fixed assets, the depreciation, the asset disposal, and the additions, they could be either in paper one or in paper two. So please, when you prepare, make sure you understand how to do and what content will be in paper one and in paper two. Then we also did the periodic and the perpetual. We have the concepts and the reporting. We have the purchases account replacing the trading stock account. The, the theory regarding the periodic and the perpetual. The perpetual, you can determine the value of the trading stock at any time. With the periodic, you have to do stock taking to determine the value. So those are the things that could be asked in either paper. And together with any ethical behavior, like your problem solving items, like the internal controls regarding all of them. Not only the fixed assets or the, or the stock, but all of them. Okay, so that will be the content for paper one. Let me look at the content for paper two. Oops, wrong way. Paper two, the same, 150 marks, two hours. So what will be in paper two? We'll be having bank reconciliation, we have been creditors reconciliation. The creditors reconciliation could be with the creditors list or the creditors reconciliation could be with the creditors statement. We will be having value added tax calculations. Remember the new standard rate is now 15%. It has changed from the 1st of April, 2018 from 14% to 15%. So make sure that the question says the standard rate because then the figures will be friendly for either the 15%. Okay. Then we did manufacturing. We had raw material stock. We had work in progress. We had finished goods. We had to determine the direct labor, the direct material. That's all got to do with cost accounting. Then there was calculations of the unit cost, and also we had to calculate the break-even point. Make sure you know the formula for the break-even point, and also you need to know how to comment on the break-even point and the level of production. That will be your manufacturing. Then there will be the budget that we were doing now. So it's either the budget or the projected income statement, also called the projected statement of comprehensive income. Then there will be auditing. So we're having internal controls regarding cash, fixed assets, inventory, debtors, creditors, income and expenses, salaries and wages, and also financial indicators. So please, once again, we'll be giving you a formula sheet, but you need to know what formula to apply. Okay? And then the last three items that was in content in paper one will be similarly, it could be tested either in paper one or in paper two. It's again, the asset disposal, the depreciation of the sold, the old and the new equipment or vehicles, any additions that we have. So it will be the ledger accounts or the fixed asset note and also the calculations of the depreciation, the pro rata. And again, we have the periodic and the perpetual with the purchases and the theory surrounding those items, and then also any other internal controls in the financial environment. Okay, so I'm hoping that the slide is shedding some idea of what will be in paper two and in paper one. Okay, so let's just sit there a bit. Thank you, Grade 11. Thank you for watching and for listening attentively. 
uh, everything of the best and I hope to see you next year in grade 12. Thank you and goodbye.